Aiden Wilson Tozer once said that we can be in our day what the heroes of faith were in theirs, but remember that they didn't know they were heroes at the time. A.W. Tozer, as he's more often called, was only a young teenage boy when he heard a street preacher say that if you were not saved, all you had to do was call out to God. So he went home and did that. Short five years later, he had started a church and was preaching. It's kind of interesting how and when God reaches us, how and when he calls us. Maybe you were raised in the church and then one day God just put a calling on your life. Maybe you've had that calling since you were young and you just knew since you were young that this is what you were going to be. This is who you were going to, what you were going to do. Maybe you didn't grow up in the church and you came to it later and now you have a, a fire and a passion burning in you. Well, I want to encourage you right now in that. So we, this is more geared to the middle school, high school age. Um, because we don't have currently a message of encouragement out there for them. So I want to shoot one directly for you guys. But if you are over high school or under middle school and you're watching this video, you're welcome to stick around. Maybe God will give you a word from it and encourage you. We are going to pray and dive into the word. That's what I say. All right. One, two, three. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come to you. We thank you that you call us, whether it be through a street preacher or, I don't know, maybe we just see the sun rising in the morning and we wonder, how does that happen? And then we learn about you. Whatever it is, God, we thank you that you do. You put those opportunities in our life for us to call out to you. And when we call out to you, you always are there and ready and willing to say, here I am. I've been waiting for you. So we thank you for that. God, give me the right words to say as I give this message. Let it be your words, not mine, God. Let me be your vessel, not my own ship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so we're going to be reading out of 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 8. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in the church. I grew up as a parent. My parents were pastor's kids. And the first church we attended, they were very well involved in the ministry. So I grew up with just my parents. That's my parents. You know, I'm involved in the ministry, even though I'm probably four or five years old. We get up early on Sunday mornings. We go to church. I help my mom move stuff around while my dad does worship practice. That's how church was for me. That's what my life was like. My parents were the kind of parents that they didn't, when they disciplined us or were talking with us, they always brought it back to scripture. Of course, I had the, the oddity of having a dad that liked to bring out the weird stories from the Bible for bedtime. I think it kind of helped shape who I am now working with the youth. But at the time, sometimes it was a little bit harder to sleep after you heard those stories. Anyway, so that's a little bit of a backstory from me that I grew up with parents who were pastor's kids. And I know that's not everybody's story. And if that's not yours, I promise there's word in here still for you. Just because you might not have been raised by pastor's kids doesn't mean that this won't apply to you as well. So I remember, but saying that I grew up in church and I would often hear this verse, one of the verses in here quoted to me. I'm just going to say it real quick is the, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Oh, I used to hear that all the time. And it was kind of exciting, but at the same time, it was like, how do I do that? How do I not let people think less of me because I'm young? That doesn't, I don't get how that works. We're going to start a little farther back. We're going to start in verse 8. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. It says, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. I'm going to stop real quick. So I have some, I've had some health issues for over a decade now. And I decided recently with the quarantine, I'm going to just start working to make sure that I'm physically in shape. And so I've started doing some physical exercise, some physical training. And it's good for me, but I don't like it. Okay. I do enjoy aspects of it. 
I feel like I feel accomplished after I'm done. But it doesn't mean that I'm sitting there going, oh, this is the greatest thing ever. Now, my brother, he loved going to the gym. He loved working out. That was fun to him. But for me, it's, it's just sometimes a little more frustrating than anything else. I want to see immediate results. And I'm not seeing immediate results. And I'm tired. And I'm sore. But I'm still going. And I did ballet for 10 years. And I remember it just became routine. Well, having not done it for so long, it's so much harder to get into it again. So much harder to get into being active again. But so it's good for me though. And we know that. We know, okay, physical training, working out, might not necessarily always be fun. But ultimately, it'll have results, right? If you're consistent, you have to be consistent. Same with reading our Bible or journaling or praying. I'm, I'm going to be really honest for a second, okay? Here I am, youth pastor being really honest. I have the hardest time, or I used to, I still a little bit do, have the hardest time journaling. I love reading the Bible. I can, you know, like write little underlined things, little tiny words in there to remind me for later when I go back and read it. But when it comes to setting this aside and pulling out a journal and actually writing out in a journal, I don't know why I struggle with it. I don't know what to write all the time. I get frustrated. I think, okay, sometimes I'm reading this and I don't really have a lot of time and so I read it and I'm like, yes, good, done, go. Don't worry about it, I'll get that later. And it's hard. It can be really hard to do these things, to remember. Now, doesn't mean that I don't enjoy my time with the Lord. I do enjoy my time with the Lord. But it can sometimes be a struggle. Or sometimes I get to church and I don't feel like worshiping. I'm having not the greatest morning. Maybe I'm super tired. I'm exhausted. Maybe I'm in pain. There's stuff going on in my life. And I just don't really feel like worshiping. And I want to say real quick, it is okay to tell God that you're just not feeling that great today. It's okay to tell God, I'm struggling. Because all throughout the Bible, people do that. In Lamentations, in Psalms, David will say, why are, my en why are you letting my enemies to attack me? But then he says, I will praise the Lord. So we do, it is okay to come to God first in that place of saying, this is how I feel. But this is what I know. This is what I feel, but this is what I know. I feel discouraged, but I know that my contentment is found in you, that I am satisfied in you. And it's okay to do that. But that's where I come from sometimes in worship. I get to worship and I say, God, I feel discouraged. I feel heavy. But I know that I can lay that all out here for you. So that's okay to do. I want to encourage you in that. But what it's saying is that we can train for godliness. Training is not always easy. But when you're consistent, when you do it again, even when it doesn't make sense, when you don't see results and you do it again, eventually you're st you'll start seeing results. Not just, I'm not saying God's going to just send showering of blessings on you. Not saying he won't bless you, but I don't think he's just going to go, oh, you're reading your Bible. Here's a bunch of blessings. But what you will see is an effect in your life, a confidence and understanding of who you are and who he is. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle for our hope is in the living God who is the savior of all people and particularly of all believers. This is our hope. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. There's the verse we all know, right? Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. But then Timothy tells us how to do it. He says, be an example to all believers, all of them, every age of believer. In what you say, what are the words that are coming out of your mouth? In the way you live, how do you live? How do you treat others? In your love, again, how do you love others? Your faith, are you strong in your faith? Do you, can you stand on this word? And your purity, 
And I'm not just talking about, well, making sure you dress modestly and you're not out every Friday night hooking up with people. Okay, I'm going to say it. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is purity in the way you live. Do the words you say, are they pure? The way you treat others, is there a purity to that? Is there a purity of your thoughts and your directions? That's something to be thinking about. And I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Because there's a lot in this world that doesn't want us to be in that place. That wants people to not be able to say, wow, look at that person. They're young, but they've, they're have they mature. But we are, we are called to stand against it. And we have God. And we have grace to catch us when we mess up. I have a saying, and it's my three rules for my classroom. They're actually written here. And it says, love is spoken here. Joy is chosen here and grace is given here. That's how God works. He speaks with love. He gives us joy. He gives us the opportunity to choose joy. And he gives us grace. And so we're going to strive and do our best to follow this. To be an example in the way, what we say, the way we live, in our love, our faith, and in our purity. Knowing that he's going to give us grace when we do fall. And it can happen. It's happened to me multiple times. I'm not perfect. I'm definitely not perfect. I'd like somebody to go ahead and find the most perfect person in the whole world. Take a picture of them. We'll hang, we'll make a nice big portrait of it. We'll hang it up and everybody can come and look at it in a museum. Cause I don't think that person exists as perfect as you think some people are. I'm pretty sure they've got faults. Or they've got weird quirks, right? We're all so different. Well, they probably got both. But we're all, we're, we all fall short of the glory of God. And that's when he gives us grace. It says, until I get there, focus on reading scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. I want that to be a focus for you. Reading the scriptures, encouraging believers and teaching others. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you receive through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your tasks so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. It's hard being a middle school or high school student. You're a young adult. You're not one of the kids, but you're not quite yet one of the adults. And you're in that kind of weird limbo. And don't worry, all us adults, we've been there. We've made those awkward life decisions as far as haircuts or outfits. We've made uh, awkward situations through the things we say around our friends. We're all there. It's part of growing up. As I tell some of the kids I watch, you're 11, you're gonna make 11 year old mistakes and you'll learn from them. And then when you're 12, you'll probably make 12 year old mistakes and you'll learn from them. I'm 22, I'm making 22 year old mistakes, but I'm learning from them. And God gives us that grace, that opportunity to learn, right? All right, so one of the things that I wanna challenge you in is you are not just the church of the future. Although you are, but you're, that's not just what you are. You are the church of now. You have a say in the kingdom of God. You have authority in the kingdom of God. Just as I do, just as Pastor Gordon does, or Pastor Bill, or Pastor Sarah. You have authority to speak the word of God and believe it, and speak this word and bring truth to others. And you might think, well, I don't know. I'm a little nervous. What if I mess up? What if I fail? And Francis Chan once said, our greatest, our greatest fear should not be the fear of failure, but of succeeding at things in this life that do not really matter. Your greatest fear should not be of, well, what if I try something? What if I try to tell someone about Jesus and they don't want to hear it? I try to tell people about Jesus sometimes and they tell me to go ahead and le talk to the hand. Okay? It's, it happens. That's when we pray. We try to remember, okay, Holy Spirit, 
you're leading. We want your discernment in this situation. But you shouldn't let the fear of possibly not saving that person in that moment stop you from speaking when you feel the Holy Spirit leading you to. Because I've had people that I felt like maybe the Holy Spirit was leading me to talk to them. And they listened for a bit and then they would get unresponsive. But every time, a little more and a little more, they would listen. And it was just the planting of seeds. We have to be obedient, even when we don't know the outcome. I was thinking of, there's a story in Judges, I believe it's 20 and 21, where the tribe of Benjamin is not not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Let's just put it that way. And the leaders of Israel said, are we supposed to, you know, God, do you want us to go to war with them? And he said, yes. So they go to war and they kept getting struck down and struck down and struck down. And they kept going back to God and God, are we supposed to attack them tomorrow? And yes, you're supposed to. And again and again. And I thought that, I don't know if I could do that. If I felt God leading me to do something and I went and did it and got cut down, I think, well, maybe I just didn't hear him. But again, they just obeyed. They did what God asked them to do. And ultimately, they had victory. But they had a victory that also allowed them to continue having relationship with the tribe of Benjamin. So I think about that sometimes. Maybe God will ask you to do something and it won't give you the results you think. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, Who can make straight what the Lord has made crooked? And that verse is something that's kind of interesting to me. But God, why would God make something crooked? Well, maybe he is working it. Maybe there's something coming out of it that we don't understand. We don't have the bigger picture, the bigger vision like he does. So I have to trust that he knows what he's doing. And that's what my faith relies on. I don't have to see the whole picture. I just have to be obedient. So I want to encourage you, our middle school and high school students, you are the church of now. If you feel God leading you, if you feel the Holy Spirit speaking to you to send a letter to somebody, do it. If you feel that God has given you a word, please don't hesitate to contact one of the leaders in our church and say, God gave me a word. We, we learned a couple weeks ago with Pastor Gordon's sermon on Samuel. Samuel is just a young boy when God gave him a word. And it wasn't like God said to Samuel, I'm going to make it rain skittles and gumdrops. It was a message of the death of Eli and his sons. Imagine being Samuel in that situation. That's not a message you want to tell somebody, especially the people you're living with. But he had to be obedient. He had to say what God said to him. Maybe God gave you a message of encouragement. Maybe God gave you a message in your heart that you felt was meant to, to be shared of something God is doing in our in our culture, in our country. Maybe you are thinking, what right do I have to say anything about what's happening in the world? You do. You have a voice. God gave you a wonderful voice and gift. And as, if you are listening to the discernment of the Holy Spirit and following in his leading, submitting under the hand of God, that's an important part. Submitting under the hand of God you have a voice. You know, I think, uh, who was it? It was um, Alistair Begg once said, there is no one who is insignificant in the purpose of God. Not a one. There is no single person, whether they're young or old, rich, poor, doesn't matter what gender they are, doesn't matter what color skin they have, doesn't matter what culture they came from. There is not a single person on the earth that is insignificant in the purpose of God. We all have a purpose. We all have, God has a plan for each of our lives. Now, ultimately it's up to us whether or not we're going to surrender to him. And I want to encourage you to do that. But I also want to encourage you in this time, don't feel like you can't say something. Don't feel like you don't have a voice in this chaos. I know you're hearing stuff on the news. You're seeing things on the news. And it's scary. And you don't know what's happening. And maybe we... But can I give you a little secret? Neither do most of the adults. We don't know what tomorrow looks like. 
And it's not really our job to know what tomorrow looks like. It's not really our job to know what two years from now looks like. It's our job to be obedient now in what the Lord is calling us to. But don't think that just because you're in high school, you don't have a voice in the kingdom of God. I've talked to a lot of high schoolers who say, well, when I graduate, then I can start being involved. No, God wants to use you in the here and now. So I wanna encourage you, take some time in this quarantine, in this downtime to get alone and ask God, do you have a word for me? What are you using me right now in this time? And if so, how do you want to use me? And surrender yourself to him right now. I think we're going to see amazing things from you guys. I believe it with my whole heart. And we need you. We need the youth of today. Because you guys understand the culture of today. You are the future. You're rising up. And we want to support you in that. You are the keepers of the flame. I think about it. We've had so many people throughout history that have passed down the torch of the church, right? You've got Paul and Peter who are passing down, Paul passing down to Timothy and to Titus. And you've got all these people that he's mentoring and discipling and it's spreading. Well, guess what? We happen to be in a generation where we have had leaders. We've had Amy Simple McPherson. We've had Billy Graham. We've had all these amazing leaders that have gone before us. And it's our turn. It's our turn now. We can't just sit back and say, well, we'll see which way the current flows. You are the youth of today. It's your turn now to make a difference. And that doesn't mean you have to go out and, uh, I don't know, completely change the way that the government works. But who's to say that you couldn't? I'm not telling you that maybe your calling is to go and, you know, completely get rid of pollution, but who's saying it isn't? Maybe your calling is to work at McDonald's and love people, but you don't know what kind of an impact that will have. I think about water when it hits, when a raindrop hits water, it ripples. And that tiny drop made such a big impact and that's you guys right here, right now, all you might be doing is reaching out to a friend and saying, I want to check in on how you're doing. You don't know what kind of a ripple effect that might have. I don't think A.W. Tozer, as a young teenage boy, knew that surrendering his life to God was going to change his life so drastically. I don't think most of the heroes of faith, even those in the Bible, realized quite what God was calling them to. I don't think David realized when he picked up those stones to throw at that giant that that was going to change the way he was seen by the people of Israel. He was just being obedient. And that's what God's calling you to do. He's not asking you to go and slay a dragon. He's asking you to be obedient and trust him. And I believe that you can do it. I believe with my whole heart that you have so much power in you because you have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And so when those voices come from the enemy telling you that you're not enough, you're small, maybe you're insignificant, well, your life affects that. Just say no. God has a plan and a purpose. God wants me to be obedient. I just want to, I want to challenge you real quick. This is my challenge to all my middle school, high school students watching. If you were to stop where you're at, surrender your whole life to God and say, God, search me, know me, and use me, what do you think God could do with you? Because I wonder that. When I see you guys, I don't have a question in my mind that God is going to use you. Every single one of you. I see so much power in you. Just be confident. Grab a hold of that inheritance and that promise over your life. 
and trust that the leaders of this church, we are 100% behind you and supporting you. We are praying for you and we believe in you. It's time for you to pick up your sword, the word. Carry your shield of faith. Put on the armor of God and walk out. Because the harvest is great and the workers are few. We're getting tired. We need you. We need your energy, your excitement, your love, your new perspective on the way you see things. We want to see more of you because we want to see more of Jesus in you. We want to see the fruit that you are bearing, the Holy Spirit's fruit. We want to see that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, thankfulness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. I think I forgot one. But you know what I'm saying here. We want to see what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. And even if you say, well, all I'm doing is sitting at home and I'm reading my Bible, God's doing something in you. If you say, well, you know, all I'm doing is going to the skate park and hanging out with some friends. God is doing something in you. And I wonder right here, right now, what do you believe that God can do through you?